Warning, spoilers. Hey everyone, how's it going? Today, I'll be reviewing Batman and Robin Volume 4, Dark Knight vs. White Knight. Now, unlike the other Batman and Robin stories I've reviewed, they're not written by Grant Morrison, and they're three separate stories and not just um, stories that are all connected. But, let's begin. The first story begins with Dick and Damien um, investigating the grave robbery of a woman named Una Nemo. Now, usually Gordon wouldn't call Batman and Robin for grave robberies. Uh, he feels like that's something that the cops could easily deal with. But Una was an old flame of Bruce Wayne's, or Thomas Elliot, um, as we'll talk about later. And um, they're worried that since Bruce has announced himself as the investor of Batman and Robin and is Korean Batman Incorporated, that it could actually be, you know, the beginning of a big plan to kill Bruce Wayne. Um... They call Bruce about this, um, asking him maybe he can help out, but Bruce says he's still in Japan, he's still working on Batman Incorporated there, so they're kind of on their own, and uh, Dick just tells him to, you know, also be careful about this. Um, they um, start looking for the body and eventually find it, still standing, um, and it turns out that Unanimo survived. Um, a uh, big shot in the head, point blank. Um... Heck, the frickin' bullet wound left a big hole that is just there. Like, yeah, uh, she survived. And uh, she's going by the name of Absence. Now, um, she wants basically payback. Because um, uh, during her relationship with Bruce, um, she really she really loved him. Like, uh, like you know, Bruce even said some really just um, emotional stuff to her, and the kind of just made her automatically fall in love with him. And uh, you know, Bruce made it look like you know it was real to him too. Now, as we can probably guess, this was not Bruce Wayne. This is most likely Thomas Elliot because uh, when Bruce Wayne was you know stuck in the past, Thomas took over and tried to ruin Bruce Wayne. But luckily, um, Batman and Robin were. Um, was able to, you know, stop Thomas from ruining Bruce's good name by, um, you know, making a deal. And basically, that deal was, you can be Bruce Wayne, but if you try anything, you know, we will, you know, rain hell upon you. We will send the Justice League, the Teen Titans, and the Outsiders, and any other superhero group that we're associated with, and they will kick your ass. Um, and I will also talk about, you know... Uh, streets of Gotham, uh, Streets of Gotham, Hush Money at some point, but yeah, Thomas was Bruce Wayne for a while and did act like a jackass at some points, and uh, you know after she died, uh, she uh, actually did test on herself. Apparently, she suffers from a condition that um, that you know keeps uh, you know her from dying. It involves like her brain. I have to look this up because I'm not really sure if this is a real thing. I'll. If it is, if, you know, a condition like this is real, uh, someone tell me, because I'm not sure if that is, but, yeah, apparently she suffers from, like, this weird condition, um, and, um, you know, when she goes to her own funeral and, uh, sees if, how people are reacting to it, she's not happy, like, people seem to be happy that she's dead and probably wouldn't care, um, that, you know, she's alive, and when she goes to see, you know, where Bruce is, Bruce didn't show up. He just left a bunch of flowers and said, you know, love Bruce. And um, that pissed her off completely, which kind of gives the idea of Thomas Elliot. Because, uh, like, Bruce Wayne has gone to several girlfriends' funerals. Like, he can go to all of them, but, uh, yeah, he would, you know, he would go to the funerals if he can. Um, and... Uh, but yeah, whether it was Bruce or Tommy, uh, she was pissed, and she wanted revenge on everyone. Um, and the payback on Bruce, uh, I won't spoil, but um, let's just say it involves Vicky Vale. Um, this story was very good. Um, the writer was uh, Paul Cornell, and uh, he was really good. Um, he was a great writer for this story. The artwork was done by Scott uh, McDaniel, and... He was also very good as well. Um, the only real issue I had with it is that I kind of felt like um, the absence head was a little bit too big. Um, not so much that, you know, it kind of got me off, but yeah, it looked a little bit too big for me. Um, 
And, you know, I think, yeah, Dick's chin was a little bit, you know, too big, too. But, you know, besides that, the artwork was pretty good. Um, and the absence of the villain, who I would be interested to see come back again, even though I'm pretty sure they'll change her character and make her less interesting as she is in here. The second story introduces the White Knight, um, the title character of this volume. Now, the story begins with Dick and Damien um, just heading off to a big event, but before they can do anything, a, um, a guy dressed like an angel just jumps off the, the roof of the building and kills himself. Now, Batman and Robin investigate this guy, seeing what the hell was up with him. Um, and they find out later that he was being controlled, and he's also the brother of Mr. Zaz. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Zaz didn't kill everyone. Uh, apparently he kept family for last. Um, and, uh, he's not the only one who's about to lose some family. Um, Mambat shows up, and, uh, he actually tells Batman and Robin, you know, that they have to help his family. And, uh, you know, he's gonna kill them. And we see his family, um, dressed like angels, carrying a bomb, about to kill themselves. Uh, Batman and Robin is able to save him in time. And, uh, they encounter the White Knight, who is, you know, just all just, just one big bright light. Like, he's just, um, a, he's kind of like a silhouette of a guy in big white light. Um, and he's carrying, like, this giant mechanical, like technological staff and he's just causing crap um he plans to attack every single um person who is related to you know um one of batman's enemies like the mad hatter the joker killer croc you name it he's after every single one of them um and after he's done killing them all he'll go after the uh main people in arkham asylum now the white knight to me, this story was actually my personal favorite um, out of the stories in here. Um, I thought the White Knight was a really cool villain, and I really would have uh, liked to see him uh, be done a lot more in uh, before the New 52. Um, and if they do bring him back, they better keep him the way he is here. But I don't think I have to worry because uh, Peter J. Tomasi is the uh, writer of the story, and he's the main writer of uh, the Batman stories right now. Um so if he does show up and uh, Tomasi's writing him, he'll do a good job. Um, Patrick Gleason is also uh, the artist in here. And uh, I talked about how I had some issues with his artwork lately, but not in this story. Like, it doesn't really have the flaws that it had before. Like, none of the characters seem to be disproportional. Um, and there aren't really weird things that you notice in there, like... Um, like I noticed in uh, Born to Kill, which I'll get into later. Like the only time I can say that a character ever looked disproportional was in that variant cover of um, of uh, the uh, White Knight story. So, you know, on a whole, it was very good. Now for the last story, The Streets Run Red, uh, where we see the return of the second Robin, Jason Todd. Last time we saw Jason, him and uh, his sidekick, um, Scarlet, caused some crap and um, attacked a villain known as the Flamingo, who, as I said before, makes Pink look scary. Now, Jason has been in Arkham for a bit, but um, Batman was able to, and by Batman I mean Bruce Wayne, was able to get him out because he's not insane. But um, Bruce, before um, he sent Jason to, you know, regular prison, he talks to him and he tries to get through Jason again. Uh, Jason also talking about how it's very interesting that, you know, now both of them have died and come back from the grave, even though you can't really say Bruce died. Um, and, uh, you know, Bruce, you know, tries to get through him, as I said before, and Jason kind of just says, eh, screw that. I I'm just, stop. Um, which even I gotta say, yeah, it's getting to the point where I don't think you can actually, you know, reason with Jason. Um... But yeah, like Jason's in jail, and uh, he he starts crap fast. Like, um, like he kills um one inmate known as the Beaver. Uh, pretty sure you can kind of guess why he's called that. And um, he makes it look like a suicide. Like he hangs him, but the inmates know for a fact that Jason did it, and they start going after him. Jason, though, you know, takes them all down to make them all look like suicides, accidents. Or, you know, two inmates try to kill each other and end up making them both, you know, die in fatal areas. Um, 
the security guards eventually figure out that this is not their fault. Jason's doing this. Like, it's clearly the Red Hood, and uh, they start wanting to get rid of him. Um, but before anything can really get serious, though, Jason gets out of jail with the help of a bunch of half-man, half-animal commandos. Yeah, uh, I don't really know who the heck these guys are, and uh, I don't know if they're from any other stories. Um, if they are, someone please tell me. Um, but the point is, they're they're after Jason for some reason. Like, it's not really explained well. But they're after Jason, and they're planning to, you know, kill Scarlet. Um, Jason gets out, though, um, gets away from these guys, and um, Batman and Robin end up joining with him. Jason also gets a new outfit, which is more of a combination of his old Red Hood outfit and uh, the uh, outfit he wore in the um, uh, in Volume 1, which I gotta say looked pretty cool. Now, the writer in this story was Judd Winnick, and yeah, Judd Winnick clearly did not read the first volume, and if he did, he probably skimmed it, because he makes several mistakes in here, like, for example... Scarlet, uh, when they talk about Scarlet, um, they say that Professor Pig killed her father um, right in front of her. But in the story, um, she killed her dad. Like, she, you know, she murdered her father. Um, and, uh, you know, there's also some plot holes and stuff that makes no sense. And just things that are not explained very well. Um, then we get into the artwork. And for some reason, in the story, there was like four artists. Um... First, we have, um, um, like, Gulim March, and, um, you know, they're all right, like, he's all right, and then we also have And, on, uh, Andre Bresson, and, uh, pretty good, too, they're both in, like, the first issue, uh, but then we have, you know, Greg, uh, Torcini, um, and his artwork in here was kind of, uh, um, yeah, it wasn't really that good. The coloring, uh, and this probably was because of the colorist. I don't know uh, who was doing the coloring, uh, who was the colorist in here, if it was, like, just the artist um, himself or it was somebody else. But the colors looked really just watered down. The characters did not look right at all besides Jason's awesome Red Hood outfit. Um, like, Damien freaking looked like a monkey. Like, yeah, I'm like, Damien looked like a monkey. Um... Scarlet looked uh, like an old lady. Um, and it was, by the way, for some reason, Scarlet is still wearing the Daltron mask, even though in the end of Ro Volume 1, the mask was um, fell off. Like, And I don't know why she would want to wear that thing again, or how she would be able to do it, because it looked like it couldn't be put back on again. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, that artwork there was just kind of, yeah. Um... And then we have Andy Smith, who is the artist for, like, I think, um, like, only two pages. Like, yeah, only two pages. And it's, like, the last, and it doesn't, and that's it. Like, and I feel like that was just a waste. Like, it, it was good artwork, but I feel like it was just a waste of time since, you know, it was only two pages. Like, I never get that. Um, but the worst part of it, and this is not Judd Winnick's fault. This kind like, I, this one you can kind just blame on you know, DC on this one. Um, they kind of hint that Red Hood and Scarlet will be having their own solo adventure, which I actually would have liked to see. Um, like, despite the flaws of the story, I would have liked to see Red Hood and Scarlet have their own, you know, uh, uh, their own series. But, unfortunately, um, this is, you know, rebooted because uh, Scarlet does not exist, and Jason ends up in a story which I'm not going to talk about anymore because, you know, I'm feeling like I'm beating a dead horse. Well, screw it. I'm not beating the dead horse. I'm just shooting it repeatedly with a machine gun. Um, but, yeah. Um, this was, like, the last story is not very really that good. Heck, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, it ended up on a top of the fourth wall. Or at least got mentioned on top of the fourth wall. Um, but, you know, that's all I gotta say. Um, as for this volume in general, the first two stories are very good, and I highly recommend, you know, fans, um, you know, pick uh, this volume just for those two stories. Um, if you're a Jason Todd fan, though, and you're hoping for a really awesome Jason story before the New 52, this is not your volume. 
Um, and that's all I got to say about Batman and Robin, Volume 4, Dark Knight versus White Knight. That's all I got to say. Goodbye.